Dr. Stephen Case earned his BS in biology from PMC Colleges in Chester, Pennsylvania, his master's in genetics from Wilkes College in Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania, and his PhD in cellular and molecular biology from the University of Southern California, Los Angeles. He then did his postgrad training at the Karolinska Institute and also at Yale. Um, he's been at the University of Mississippi since 1979 and been a professor in the Department of Biochemistry since 1990. Um, during his research career, he was a principal investigator for over two, $2 million worth of funding and authored more than 50 scientific publications. He's also served as an ad hoc reviewer for funding agencies and scientific journals and was the editor of Gene until 1992 and the senior editor for the North South American International Journal of Biologic Macromolecules. With that, you might ask, why is he coming today to speak to us for Medical Education Grand Rounds? Um, well, in, in 2000, uh, Dr. Case had a career change and was appointed Associate Dean for Medical School Admissions and Chair of the Admissions Committee at the University of Mississippi. Um, he then has served with the AAMC on the Group for Student Affairs. He's been the chair of the Southern Region, GSA. He's also a member of the GSA National Steering Committee, the AAMC Annual Meeting Planning Committee, uh, the AAMC Criminal Background Check Implementation Advisory Committee, and has, uh, is a trained facilitator for the AAMC Holistic Review Admissions Workshops. I find it um, um, ironic that he's coming to talk today since the AAMC just released yesterday their data on the medical school admissions classes. So it turns out there's been a 1.5% increase in enrollment to medical schools. 19,517 medical, medical students were enrolled this year. Um, there was a 3.1% increase in applications, so there were 45,266 applications for medical school this year. <coughs> the average undergraduate GPA was 3.54, and the mean MCAT was 29. And there were uh, the of all of the medical students admitted to medical school this year, 771 were from new medical schools that had just gotten accreditation within the last three year or four years. So with that, uh, Dr. Case is gonna talk about transforming medical school admissions. Well, it is indeed an honor to be able to address you today. The hat I'm going to be wearing during most of my presentation will be in my current role. I'm the AAMC Chair of the National Committee on Admissions. I'm not here to lecture you about your admissions process, but what I'd like to do today is give you a feel at the national level about some transformations that are taking place in medical school admissions. Uh, if I'm successful, I hope to convince you that there have been three or four major projects, although highly related, They've been frankly running on independent tracks. And perhaps now for the first time at AAMC, there's gonna be some effort to pull all these tracks together and uh, get us going in the same direction. So if you allow me, I'll move on and uh, share with you what I'd like to do today. When Darrell Kirsch first became president and CEO of the AAMC, he identified about three or four areas that he considered high priority for his attention and transforming medical school admissions was one of them. In the September 2010 uh, AAMC Reporter article, he took the lead, and I'd like to just show you a few bullet points from what he laid out there. First, to recognize, in his view, the call for transforming medical school admissions was coming from the top down. The leadership of AAMC thought it was time to implement some changes. He was very careful to point out that things weren't broken in medical school admissions. I think all of our medical schools nationwide enjoy a very high success rate if you look at things such as graduation outcomes. So what was there to tickle with? And I think the key that he was trying to emphasize was that whether it's for practical reasons or philosophical reasons, a lot of our processes were driven by metrics. Grades and MCAT scores are always the fallback to go back and look at applicants. And what few people appreciated then, or I will say even appreciate now, is that there are data to support the notion that a wide range of metrics can predict success in medical school. So I'll throw one number out to you perhaps you're not familiar with. If you look at graduation rates, 
MCATs from 24 to 45, there is no significant difference in graduation rates nationwide for medical school. So the context that Dr. Kirsch was trying to put here is although many of us tend to lean on metrics in our admissions decisions, were we missing applicants who may have lower but quite acceptable metrics who had lots of other things to offer our students in medical school as well as for physicians in the practicing workforce. So what's the issue? The issue is metrics are easier things for medical schools to process. You've got roughly 5,000 applicants to Mount Sinai School of Medicine. It's certainly a lot easier to process a list of metrics than it is to take the time and delve into applicants and learn about, for example, the life experiences that they have or the personal attributes that they might contribute to your medical school class. And I think it was very key that Dr. Kirsch recognize it's not that admissions committees were unwilling to consider these things, but they didn't have tools in hand. And so he was committed to having a number of projects ongoing to get some high profile attention, perhaps to help close this gap in the admissions process. And his rationale for doing so was research based on other professions that showed when these other factors were taken into consideration, one can in fact influence and to some degree even alter the pool of applicants who do get interviewed for professional school. So let me show you some of the projects then were ongoing. And again, this is something that began before Dr. Kirsch came on board, but he has certainly been an advocate of the holistic review project. This team's been working for some years. They've put out some key publications. Most of them come under the heading of the Roadmap to Diversity. The first publication that came out in 2008 had to do with the legal foundations for medical schools considering diversity in the admissions process. In 2010, their second publication came out, which talked about doing a holistic review admissions process. The third publication in this series will come out next year in 2013, and that will talk about evaluating the outcomes of holistic review processes. So a project that's been supported by a number of major publications providing information. One of the side spin-offs of the Holistic Review Project has been the Holistic Review Admissions Workshop. I'm about, uh, one of about a dozen or so trained facilitators. We've gone around the country over the past three years and have actually done this workshop at 43 different medical schools. This is one of those things, if a medical school is interested, they apply to AAMC and they select the schools that they can accommodate. They've been averaging about 10 or 12 of these workshops per year. The workshop on site basically entails a half day, pretty intense facilitator led session with your admissions committee or other related people. Uh, they are given some wonderful tools during this workshop, not the least of which is this publication that allows participants to follow through the lessons and the activities during the workshop. And most importantly, the workshop should really be the catalyst for a series of subsequent meetings that the school's willing to commit to and where their admissions committee and related admissions officers discuss how and what would they like to implement from what they've learned during this workshop. Let me summarize the take home messages of the workshop in the following way. Number one, the major point to be made is that the admissions process for any medical school should be grounded in the mission and the diversity interest that's unique to each medical school. Secondly, it touts the idea that diversity is a driver of educational excellence. Thirdly, Diversity is not limited to race, ethnicity, and gender, but diversity describes the multiple dimensions by which we should be able to describe our applicants, the students we want to educate, and the physicians we'd like to graduate into the workforce. Diversity should include demographic things, including socioeconomic and educational backgrounds. Diversity should include the life experiences that an applicant brings to us as well as the personal attributes they have. It's up to each school to define those experiences and attributes as well as the metrics that they seek. 
But the concept then is that if you put these three things on the table, that's why we refer to it as the EAM model, experiences, attributes, and metrics, by and large for a lot of medical schools, although those three things are being considered, it's metrics that's tipping the scale. And one of the outcomes of the holistic review workshop is a model that perhaps one can use to help balance the consideration of experiences, attributes, and metrics. In other words, help justify or rationalize or document how applicants with some superlative metrics are not being accepted to your medical school because they lack either the experiences or personal attributes that you seek, or conversely, applicants who might have what you consider to be minimally acceptable metrics are being accepted because they happen to bring some very unique life experiences and or personal attributes that would add to the educational benefit of all your students. So that's the take home message of that workshop. On a separate parallel track, there's the MR5 committee and that acronym stands for the fifth review of the medical college admissions test. You're all probably quite familiar with the exam, but you might not realize the same exam has been given since 1999. And even psychometricians will tell you every now and then you've got to review these things. So I'd just like you to know that the AAMC assembled a committee. They worked for three years. They took lots of input from stakeholders, including undergraduate and medical school faculty, public opinion polls, content experts, etc. And after lots of deliberations over three years, made some very profound recommendations for changes in the medical college admissions test, which is summarized in this last bullet. First and foremost, they decided that biochemistry should be part of the content of the medical college admissions test. And to support the notion that medical schools should be seeking students who have something to offer besides their background in science courses, please remember I'm a biochemist now, that they should also have some background in social and behavioral sciences. So in 2015, starting the spring, this is what the new MCAT will look like. Biochemistry is incorporated there under biological and biochemical foundations. Chemistry and physics are sort of in a section they used to be in anyway. In the lower left-hand quadrant here, you've got the psychological, social, and biological foundations of behavior, emphasizing again the desire for students to have some familiarity with these areas. And then last, the critical analysis and reading skills. The folks at the MCAT, I think, have done a fantastic job in terms of making materials available. This is the second edition of their MCAT preview guide for 2015. And what you need to know is that for all four sections of the exam that I showed you, this guide lists the foundational concepts underlying each of the four sections of the exam, as well as content categories and sample questions. The Committee on Admissions later this fall will actually be reaching out to our medical schools nationwide, reminding folks it's not just the admissions officers who need to be aware of these things, but we need the admissions officers at medical schools nationwide to be reaching out to the undergraduate schools that help feed you and make sure that the undergraduate pre-medical advisors are aware of these forthcoming changes. We've also been reaching out to them directly through the National Associations of Health Professions Advisors. Okay, so changes in the MCAT. On the third independent and parallel track, uh, I see smiles around the table, so certainly a number of you here in the room are familiar with this report that came out in 2010. Uh, it's the conclusion of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute AAMC Joint Committee. Their report was titled Scientific Foundations for Future Physicians. And to very briefly state the intent, they asked the question, what does an entering medical student need to succeed in medical school? What does a medical student need to graduate and be a successful postgraduate medical student? And the bottom line is that they recommend giving both the students and the faculty who teach students added flexibility. And the first target of this was trying to drop the concept of making everything based on a list of required courses and perhaps substituting that with the idea of achieving competencies.
If you have time to look at this report, I can give you the quick digestion of it. For schools like mine that have traditionally had a list of required courses, their recommendation instead is ask if your applicant has met these eight entering student competencies. And if your medical school is brave enough, ask if your graduates have met their suggested list of eight medical student competencies. Now don't panic, these things are not as simple as they appear. For each of these competencies, there's a good list of learning objectives through which hopefully the pre-medical and medical student would achieve these competencies. But this absolutely was a pretty bold concept to put out across the country to ask schools to start thinking this way. Certainly as a biochemist, I was anxious to see how the scientific community would react to that. I was pleasantly surprised to find the following. A lead guest editorial in Science Magazine came out strongly in support of moving from required courses to competencies. That same issue had a, a, a letter down here, competencies, a cure for the pre-medical education curriculum, signed off by more than 30 very prominent scientists supporting the notion that this would actually give them greater flexibility in undergraduate education if medical schools, in fact, would consider moving to this model. And last but not least, the American Society for Biological Chemistry and Molecular Biology came out with a position paper. And I'll summarize their paper with the following slide. Their recommendation in terms of what a pre-medical curriculum <coughs> should have, remembering in parallel that the MCAT has suggested biochemistry be part of the subject matter. Their recommendation was the following. First off, an applicant should have some exposure to biology. But for all the schools who like to list biology one and two as an entrance requirement, have they considered the fact that at some undergraduate institutions, this is still talking about taxonomy and um, botany? Have they actually thought about the content of what they're asking in these courses? So they say, if you want to require biology, have something more modernized, cellular, molecular biology, biological information transfer this would be more useful for an entering medical student than some of the classic biology courses that are being taught. Secondly, in terms of chemistry, for a science major, the normal track to get to biochemistry is two full years of chemistry. The American Biological Chemistry Society recommended, not for science major, but for a student who's interested in entering medical school, Perhaps the two full years of chemistry, general chemistry and organic chemistry, could be distilled down to one year of chemistry relevant to a biochemistry course. And then that would allow the student in their third semester to get into an introductory biochemistry course. So streamlining the pathway by which an undergraduate can get to biochemistry. I think you have to admit there's not too many science majors, excuse me, non-science majors who are willing to go through five semesters of chemistry for the opportunity to apply to medical school. So they've actually recommended streamlining that. The same paper also noted the value in laboratory courses associated with the sciences, but again questioned does the student really need to take laboratories in all of the science courses that we typically require, or instead would a well-designed single laboratory course in any one of those subjects in which the student was introduced to the concepts of research methods and particularly statistics and analyzing data, if that not would, uh, would that not suffice in giving an entering medical student what they need to begin their medical education. On a fourth track, and it was about this time, I think, that the National Committee on Admissions recognized we had these trains running on parallel tracks. We actually requested the AAMC to start thinking about bringing these things under one umbrella. And so I'm going to use this as an independent track at the moment. What was initiated under Darrell Kirsch's leadership was the so-called admissions initiatives. And these got broken down into two categories. The first had to do with personal competencies, and this is being headed up by Steve Fitzpatrick at the AAMC, working very closely with the National Committee on Admissions. 
The goal here was taking input from that MR5 committee that revamped the MCAT, as well as a subgroup of them called the Innovations Working Lab, our National Committee on Admissions, as well as the Committee on Diversity Affairs. And the goal was to come up with a common set of core personal competencies that we could all agree on. This is not to say any one medical school would be limited to these nine personal competencies, but try to identify nine, it wasn't a target of nine, we ended up with nine that we felt all medical schools could agree to, and this is how they broke down. The idea that would be, some would be interpersonal competencies, as listed here, service orientation, social and interpersonal skills, cultural competence, teamwork, oral communication, and complement that the following intrapersonal competencies, integrity and ethics, reliability, dependability, resilience and adaptability, and capacity for improvement. Why try to come up with a common set of personal competencies? The idea being that if we could get medical schools to agree on a common set, then perhaps we could move forward and look for multiple ways of assessing these. Now these are ideas, these are not things in process yet. The list has been agreed to, but to give you some idea of the application, we're talking about, for example, as part of the AMCAS application, asking applicants to reflect on the personal experiences that they have that might illustrate their strengths in these personal competencies. At the same time, perhaps develop an evaluation form that hypothetically might replace or be appended to faculty evaluations that ask external raters to evaluate applicants on this common list of personal competencies. And last but not least, and perhaps the most far-fetched at the moment, is looking into some type of national nationally administered behavioral exam that might also provide some measures of these personal competencies. So again, the concept being if there's a common list we can agree to, perhaps we can get these things evaluated for each applicant through multiple sources, therefore giving the admissions committee a little more confidence versus some of us rely on the interaction of a single interviewer in evaluating ethical knowledge of an applicant. Also under admissions initiatives, there's the academic component to complement the personal side. Henry Sondheimer at the AAMC is heading up this initiative. Uh, it will recognize, or what started this was the recognition that the MCAT was scheduled to be changed and will include biochemistry in it. The question became, what options are there for schools besides their list of required courses, and how many schools would be willing to consider these options? So back in March, of 2012, with the assistance of the Committee on Admissions and the AAMC staff, we actually went out and surveyed admissions officers uh, on this area. And I'm just going to briefly summarize a few points. Number one, at least two-thirds of the responding schools admitted to the fact that in spite of all these things that were going on with the MCAT, the Howard Hughes report, etc., more than two-thirds of the schools had not taken the time to sit down and even look at their current list of required courses. More than half the schools also admitted they had no plans to do so in the next two years, nor did those schools have they started any discussions about moving <coughs> from required courses to competency-based admissions. In other words, things were in a pretty stagnant situation nationwide. Recognizing that going from required courses hypothetically to competency-based admissions would take considerable time, it's nothing that's going to uh, happen with the throw of switch, could we from the AAMC and the Committee on Admissions offer some intermediate solutions that schools would consider? So the bridge solution that was put on the table for schools to consider, I will try to illustrate in the following way. Uh, for example, if you're a school like mine that has a list of required courses, what might this alternative bridge look like? Well, one solution was to list the final course in a series rather than prescribe all the courses to get there. Let me see if I can illustrate that for you. For example, we require two semesters of biology. How might we define that in this new bridge model? 
simply say, you need a second semester of biology. I know that doesn't look too earth shattering at you, all right? Let's look at chemistry, however. We now would say, if we want our students to have biochemistry, our current format would say, you need two semesters of general chemistry, two semesters of organic chemistry, and one semester of biochemistry. The bridge model would have us simply say, acquire a semester of biochemistry. What's the difference? It allows the undergraduate institutions the flexibility for determining how their students get to that biochemistry course. For example, if they accept AP credit for freshman chemistry, if they're willing to design some novel curricula that reduce two years of chemistry to one, let the undergraduate institutions, which take great pride in the outcomes of their students, let them design the pathway to get there. We simply ask that the student have a semester of biochemistry. So we actually put this bridge model on the survey, and I'll show you the reaction to it was simply this. Uh, clearly, most schools said, given the choice, if, if the majority of medical schools supported one model or the other, the list of courses or the bridge, what would your school prefer to do? And I think, not surprisingly, the majority of the medical schools were most comfortable with keeping with their list of prescribed courses. I looked at it from the other point of view. I was encouraged by how many schools were willing to consider doing an alternative to that list. And so the bottom line of the extensive survey is the following. There was no consensus right now amongst our medical schools as to what to do with admissions criteria. However, what was surprising and I think very encouraging is we found examples of medical schools that are currently or will soon be doing all of the following. Number one, there are schools that are going to stay with the prescribed list of required courses. There are schools, in fact, some have already started this, where they're going to that bridge model. Just list the endpoint and let students and their undergraduate schools figure out how to get there. What was surprising to me, and it might be my naivete, was finding out there are medical schools that do not require any courses. They simply list recommendations. And one of these schools have been doing this for several decades, in fact. Thirdly, there are schools that following the Howard Hughes model are going to move towards competency-based admissions rather than talk about listing courses. And last, last but not least, there are schools that are investing in looking at programs that offer novel curricula. Whereas I think you can understand the list of required courses, let me take a moment to digress on these last two and illustrate for you what I'm talking about. So let me start out with competency-based admissions. Allow me to uh, slip my hat on as Dean of Admissions in Mississippi. For those not familiar, uh, we've got some of the worst health care needs of any state. We have the fewest physicians per capita. Our mission, and being the only medical school in the state, our mission is to try to train physicians most likely to practice in Mississippi. I give you all those comments to say we only accept Mississippi residents to our medical school. So I understand I have a very different applicant pool, both in terms of number and background than you have to deal with. But this afforded me an opportunity to do the following. I actually reached out to our key feeder institutions, three public universities that range in size from about 15 to 20,000, and two liberal arts colleges whose enrollment ranges between roughly one and 5,000. And with the assistance of the provost or appropriate dean who called a meeting on my behalf of department chairs, interested faculty and pre-medical advisors, we sat down and had a discussion. We talked about some of the things we just discussed here in terms of the transformation going on in medical school admissions, and then I brought them to that Howard Hughes report. And my question to them was, if we went to competency-based admissions, what burden might that put on you? In other words, does your existing curriculum support that, or would you have to do something different to allow us to do that? And very briefly, here's a tool I developed, and I don't expect you can read this. I just want to illustrate I provided them a spreadsheet. Columns allow them to list course numbers and names. And down the right-hand column were the details from the Howard Hughes report. 
lines in gray were one of those entering student competencies under which there were multiple learning objectives listed and under each learning objective examples. And what I asked these chairmen to do in collaboration with their faculty was list all your courses and for any course you offer, check off if it addresses one of these learning objectives. And let's see what falls out from that. I was delighted to get some widespread cooperation across the schools. This is just a bird's eye view of the course competency map from one school. I use it to only illustrate the following. Uh, departments are color coded. Here's the eight lines with the competencies. And the take home message from this exercise, number one was whether it was the smallest liberal arts college or the largest public university. With courses currently being offered at these institutions, there were multiple pathways for their students to cover the entering competencies recommended by the Howard Hughes Institute. In other words, none of the schools had to go through any kind of curriculum redesign to be able to afford these opportunities to the students if we chose to go to that model. The second thing that came out of this was some interesting discussions. And I'll be honest with you, as administrator, I understand the practicalities that deans and department chairs have to face. Department chairs were very satisfied with leaving things as is. After all, this, the chemistry chairs often reminded me their goal was not to train pre-medical students. They were training students for careers in chemistry. But what's fascinating is after the dust settled, on almost all campuses, junior faculty got together and started having discussions. And I'll just take you quickly to the outcomes. I want to put this under the heading novel curricula because this paper, which I hope everybody in this room is well aware of, we're going to point the fingers back to the Medicine and Humanities program here at Mount Sinai. One of the chancellors, for example, the University of Mississippi, not to mention the dean of the Honors College, was highly aware of this program. And when they looked at this paper, which conclusions were down here, students without the traditional background, meaning sciences of medical students, could succeed quite well here in medical school. This has been touted as a catalyst for discussions about not only going to competency-based admissions, but perhaps considering novel curricula, such as the medical humanities program here. And the impact that has had is the following. For example, up at the University of Mississippi, those junior faculty who are already used to doing research projects that cross departmental lines have had a discussion, oh, thank you, about putting together an interdepartmental track of courses. Of course, no chair wanted to house this thing, but the dean of the Honors College was quite excited about the prospect of housing this track of courses that could be offered to non-science majors interested in medical school. They would try to cover the Howard Hughes competencies in terms of basic natural sciences, bring in also the social and behavioral aspects, and wrap these around some of the chronic disease states that are associated in Mississippi. Totally independently of that, one of our small colleges, Millsaps College, was a recipient of a $1.4 million grant by the Howard Hughes Industry, uh, uh, Medical Institute to actually put together a, again, interdepartmental track of courses that could provide students uh, the competencies listed in the Howard Hughes AAMC report. So again, I'm trying to show you that the program that began here, I think almost a decade ago, and I was very excited to learn is still going and learn some more details about it. I think it's just really going to start getting the attention it deserves as it serves as a catalyst for other schools to consider alternative ways of preparing students for medical school. And last, probably the biggest experiment that's ongoing, you may not have heard of this, it's called Transformation of Medical Education in Texas. What they're doing is they put together four pilot programs with 10 different institutions. Their goal is to try to identify students in their sophomore year of college and in short, put them through what could be a combined six or seven year program that would cover both their pre-medical and medical education on sort of a competency-based system. So four very different things, but I all like to put them under the heading of novel curricula. I remind you then that there are medical schools currently, based on our survey, who are thinking of switching 
to either competency-based admissions or consider applicants who come from these novel curricula as candidates for their medical school. Last but not least, all these parallel tracks, is anybody going to get us all on the same track together? The current effort right now at the AAMC with the Committee on Admissions is in fact to pull all these things together. So our discussions that are ongoing now is trying to devise a quote, complete competency model. Who's going to pick which things we're going to use? Let's try to put them all together. And so there's an attempt being done by the AAMC staff to look at the Howard Hughes report, the Scientific Foundations for Future Physicians, recommendations that came out of the MCAT review, as well as the intra intrapersonal competencies, and finally assemble one table, if you will, that relates all these things, and then most importantly, ask the question, have we got in place tools that will help medical schools assess these things, and if not, try to develop them? And again, the goal being, at least hypothetically, try to make these available in tools that would be available to admissions committees early in the admissions process, so perhaps they might even be able to consider them when screening applicants for interviews so that interviews aren't solely uh, metrics-based. So where are we now? My view is the following. Still most of our medical schools are requiring courses for admissions. Next thing that's happened is MCAT, spring of 2015. This is carved in stone. The change is going to happen. What might be coming on the near horizon? I think it's clear that some schools are considering loosening up their requirements using either this so-called endpoint bridge model, way of describing courses, or actually dropping requirements altogether and having recommended courses for admissions rather than required courses. Probably still way out on the horizon will be the concept of schools going to competency-based admissions or admissions based on novel curricula. I think one of the things I find most exciting. So looking down the road, what you're going to do? My esteemed colleague, those of you who may know Carol Elam from the University of Kentucky School of Medicine, chaired a session at our combined central Southern GSA titled What You're Going to Do, and it was covering the same topics more or less that I described to you today. I thought Carol's slide was an articulate wrap-up of what we face, and I'm going to quote it if you'll per permit me. First, it's clear that we are on a period of transition and change. To respond effectively, we must recognize we have a lot of work. It will require us to be cooperative and collaborative. That's not only within our institutions and between medical schools, but that will certainly involve communicating with the undergraduate schools that provide the pipeline of students to our medical schools. And perhaps, in the future, even competencies will be part of our institutions. Thank you for giving me your attention. And uh, if we do have time, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Yes, sir. graduation rates, anything between a 20, anything if it's 24 and up on the MCAT, the graduation rates are no different. Mm -hmm. Is there any consideration of scoring the MCAT as a, a pass-fail or meets competency, does not meet competency, and, and taking away that whole factor of pretending that people who manage to get a higher and higher grade are actually more qualified? Yeah, if I may take my hat off as national chair, you just warmed my heart. Thank you. Uh, certainly, that was an, um, among a number of suggestions made by more than one group. If we get the numbers out of there, perhaps this tool will be more useful. Um, I'm simply going to say, again, using outside advisors and consultants, the bottom line is the conclusion is it will be scored in a manner similar to the current system. The only thing that's up for debate right now is how long the old and new scores will be co-reported, and will they be done so in a way that admissions committees can recognize the difference between a 99 MCAT score and a 2015. Uh, to rephrase that last comment, if you give 15 points per section, which is what we currently do, a 40 
on the 99 MCAT and a 40 on the 2015 MCAT would be very different since the maximum on the new exam would be 60 points. So there's not a solution to that yet, but the MCAT people actually at a professional development conference for admissions officers poll the admissions communities on several different ways of reporting it. So I don't know what the final outcome is yet other than both scores will be reported for a period of time so students in 2016 suddenly don't have to take a new MCAT. The scores will be distinguishable, but they're still going to go back to numeric values. Well, again, this is me personally. No, I would have loved to see it come out to more something like, you know, pass, fail, high pass, bracket it. Um, you know, when you have more broad categories, it, it takes the committee more time to think and look for other reasons as to why to take or not to take a student versus one of these statistically insignificant statements of, well, that 35 is better than a 33, when in fact statistically they're identical. So personally disappointed in that, but I'm going to defer to the experts who had their reasons why they thought it would better serve the needs to do that. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. What do you of which is MCAT scores versus the third class? I mean, what's about how we can put that out of the picture? Uh, and not stop reporting at once the other results? Because you know, as long as that's hanging over on the yeah. board's head, it's going to be a big deal. So, so here's the reality number one. Um, the National Committee on uh, Admissions, both under my predecessor's leadership and my leadership, have gone through the Group on Student Affairs through a Council of Deans representative. Our current representative, by the way, is Steve Burke from Texas Tech. And I can assure you that uh, Steve made a very vocal and rationed and data-driven plea to the Council of Deans requesting that across the board all U.S. medical schools withdraw from the rankings, stop providing information to U.S. News and Business World. I'll tell you his success was no different than it was four or five years ago. <laughs> okay? Schools that rank well still want to have those things there. What I think the answer to that is, and we've had discussions with Daryl Kirsch about this, and I don't know if you all are familiar with this. If not, I hope you'll make the inquiry. Uh, starting about two or three years ago, the AAMC sent the dean, the big dean, a document called a mission management tool. Each medical school gets one, and what it does is show you how your school performs against other medical schools in a variety of categories. And this is based not on subjective evaluations or people reading sources about your NIH funding. It's about outcome parameters, your students' performance on exams, <laughs> your students' responses to things like the graduation questionnaire. What it does is show how you rank against other U.S. medical schools in these categories, and the hope is that this document would be disseminated, at least amongst members of the administration, so that each medical school can go out and brag on those things, one, that they value, and two, that they do well in. For example, perhaps not surprisingly, our school ranked amongst the top 5% of all U.S. medical schools in terms of physicians practicing in rural areas. That's not surprising, but now we have documentation where we can show that, and that's certainly part of our mission. So if you haven't seen this document, I would encourage you. Eric, have you seen that at all from Mount Sinai? Well, your big dean gets it every year. I think the first year was kind of asked the deans to look at it um, more in closed session, look at it, consider it. I know the past year was encouraged that this be at least distributed amongst the associate deans. So it's meant to be not public document, but at least disseminated amongst the administration. So uh, hopefully you'll request your dean share that document with you. If they can't find it, they can request it from Henry Sondheimer. And uh, find out those areas that Mount Sinai is doing well in, so you can advertise that. Areas you care about, perhaps you're not doing as well in, at least you can target those for change. Erica. So the gorilla's in good company with the elephant in the room, Fisher versus UT Austin. Uh -huh. so how do you to balance the seesaw uh, with the attributes and experiences if Fisher wins. Yeah. 
So this again goes back to one of the concepts with the holistic review workshop, okay? Uh, to be more explicit, uh, a medical school's missions processes should be aligned with the school's mission and diversity interests, okay? What I'm gonna tell you, at least from personal experience at my school, is having an admissions committee understanding our mission, which certainly includes racial and ethnic diversity in the state we live in, they looked at our mission statement and found no authority, no power to do something about that. And so it was a request from the admissions committee to the administration that got our school to re-examine our mission statement. Now these things are usually carved in stone, and as you can imagine, not a whole lot of change occurred. However, there was the inclusion of a phrase that said diversity is a core value of this institution. And then that enabled us to write a diversity interest statement that articulated how we define diversity. That has now empowered the admissions committee whether it's looking at race, ethnicity, gender, socioeconomic background, educational disadvantages, these things are articulated in our diversity interest statement and linked back to the mission statement. And this has had, led to some very robust discussions with the admissions committee. You know, again, an applicant, let's just go back to that MCAT range, 24 to 45. Here's an applicant with a, you know, 24. Most instances, they're not in the running for a position in the class. But now a committee member will say, but this applicant served in the military, has some unique experiences to bring, came from a socioeconomically disadvantaged background, et cetera. Yes, they're on that low end of the metric range, but look all the value they have to add to our class. And that has empowered the committee to reach out and make some very different decisions. And conversely, then some applicants with some superlative metrics were frankly lacking in these areas and gave them the confidence to say, other than being bright and capable, here's an applicant that really doesn't have much to add to the diversity of our class, and therefore we're not going to accept them. So with that context, I think the outcome of Fisher v. Texas will not have the impact it might have should the Supreme Court decide to overturn it because we will still say this is part of our diversity interest statement. We think that gives us the power, at least our legal counsel feels that way. With that said, uh, if you're not familiar, the oral arguments have been heard in Fisher v. Texas, and next week in San Francisco, Art Coleman from the Education Council, who actually attended those sessions, will be giving us an update under the hot topics, Fisher v. Texas, and Art will try to represent to us uh, what he heard in the oral arguments, and although he's not going to be a prognosticator and predict outcomes, uh, I'm hoping what Art will be able to do is give medical schools some thoughts as to how they might be thinking regardless of what the ultimate outcome on that uh, court case is. So I'll encourage you to come hear Art at that session. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, I can't quite hear you. Sorry, Andy. back to the microphone so I can keep this young lady happy here. So if I could rephrase your question and make sure I understand it. Has the AAMC taken into account the perspective of current students and recent graduates into all these thoughts and processes and projects? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Answer is there have been students involved and graduates on all these different committees. So the Committee on Admissions, for example, has a representative from the Organization of Student Representatives. They had input on the MCAT and all the other projects. So at the national level, there's student and residents. There's the organization of residency programs. So there's representation at the national level, and we try to encourage our schools to also bring in the regional representation to get input from these things. Okay? Anybody else? Well, again, thank you for taking the time to come listen, and I appreciate your questions.